The Bible is a book like no other. It is one book made up of 66 smaller books that all work together to tell one story, God's story. In this podcast, theologian Kim Burgess helps listeners make sense of that story and to read the Bible the way it was intended. This is Covenant Hermeneutics and Biblical Eschatology. We are back with uh, Kim Burgess, and now we're going to get into applying a lot of the, the, the seemingly complex issues with this by going to the Gospel of John, where Jesus is dealing with the Samaritan woman. And I think this is kind of typical of what we're looking at here. He's, de- he's talking to someone who really does not understand what, who he is and what this is all about. And so I think this is a great example for us because a lot of Christians, again, are like the Samaritan woman, not in terms of her lifestyle, but in terms of her knowledge of what the Bible says about these, about these issues. And Jesus is talking in his terms very plainly to her, but she's not getting it. Yes. And, and so, don't, so don't feel like, hey, I'm not getting this because... We have an example in Scripture here, a couple of places. Nicodemus, who was a teacher in Israel, he didn't get it either. Nor did the disciples. I'll, I'll bring out three passages, not just her, but Nicodemus and the disciples on that very issue. And why didn't they get it? For the very issue that we're trying to deal in the whole series, she was coming at it from the wrong hermeneutical worldview. So it made no sense to her. She did. She couldn't get it. She was in the wrong ballpark. Even the epistles, I mean, those epistles are written to help people get it. Yes. And uh, so, but we have some great examples in the gospel. So, Kim, what, do you want to start with John 4? And Sure. Let me ahead. read the text first. I'm going to start uh, um, down in verse 19 of chapter 4, because it cuts to the chase of, of what the issue was. And then I'll back up to, to, to verses 10 and 11. But anyway, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this, in this mountain, and she's talking about Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And you people, that is you Jews, say that in Jerusalem, that is in Mount Zion, is the place where men ought to worship. So she put the thumb on the table. That's her hermeneutical worldview. Her basic issue was, which physical, visible mountain is it going to be? Which one's the holy mountain? And Jesus doesn't even go down that trail. He basically says, i got to teach you some hermeneutics here. You know, there's a different... Min- mindset that's operating. So Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We Jews, we worship that which we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, in fact, it's already begun, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I we said a while ago and previously that we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you up front. So this is really the most important lesson of all, because this, what I'm about to say about what Jesus said here, is to illustrate what the hermeneutic is. Whether you understand it or not, whether you wind up being misty-eyed like a deer in the road like she was, this is still the bottom line about how we are to approach it. And so let me look at verse 23 and 24. Maybe jump, Gary, you can jump into this question. We hear all the time worshiping God in spirit and truth. Now, how, that verse is always used. I was part of a CRC church plant that didn't get, really get off the ground, but in the liturgy every week they were using that phrase, yes, we will worship in spirit and in truth. Is that is that the context or is that the meaning of Jesus' words here? Is if Jesus was asking a question by saying, well, just make sure you worship sincerely and from the heart. <laughs> Well, let, it's me, ob- let me go ahead. It's, ob- it's obvious uh, that he has uh, much more in mind because he wouldn't th- he wouldn't just throw that out there. That would be with, totally unrelated to her question. With, exactly, and she would have no understanding of. Right. Oh, now I know. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Uh, have a great day. I'm going to go back to my Samaritan friends and tell me I'm, we're supposed to worship in terms of spirit and truth. Right. They're going to they're going to scratch their heads and say, "Well, what does that mean?" What Jesus was doing here was saying, here's the hermeneutic. So let me let me get just cut to the chase. Verse 23 and verse 24 
first of all, it's not in spirit and in truth. It's in spirit and truth. That's the first thing you need to know. The second one is in spirit. It's not little s as if it's, you know, from the heart, spiritual worship. It's in spirit, capital S, in spirit. And then the word truth is really the kicker. We're, we're Westerners. We think truth. We think we hear truth. We think false. Just like we think good, we think bad, whatever. But that's not what this word means. It's a rich, rich word. Yes, it carries that idea of true versus false. But again, like in the mindset of the epistle of the Hebrews, the best word you could use here is reality. In truth and reality. And then if I really want to transpose this thing into, you know, to get across what Jesus is saying, let me do it this way. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in the reality of the spirit, which answers her question. It's not going to be a physical mountain, Mormon. I don't care whether it's, you're talking about the one in Samaria or the one in Jerusalem. Neither one is the mountain that the new covenant king of God is talking about. It's a spiritual mountain. It's a spiritual reality. Now, why is that the case? Because God himself is spirit, not flesh and bones and blood, and tangible and visible and material. So this is kind of like what John, what Jesus, or Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And she's still dabbling in the childish things. She hasn't moved up to this level of uh, the spiritual realm. Now, let me back up in, in the, this chapter in verse 10. I think it is 10. Yes. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now look what she says, because she's got the wrong hermeneutic. She's in the wrong hermeneutical world. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And then later on, she basically, basically says, I'm sick and tired of coming to this well every day and drawing all this water to feed my camels. I mean, she's not even on the same page as Jesus, but he's trying to teach it. Now, flip back to Nicodemus, as we were talking about in chapter 3. Jesus says, you must be born again. And unless you are, you cannot see, much less enter the kingdom of God. And then Nick, verse 4 of chapter 3, Jesus said to him, to Jesus, how can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter his uh, second time to his mother's womb. He'd be born, can he? And we laugh at that because we see his fallacious mistake. But what I'm trying to say here, and it's going to shock people, is our whole approach to biblical eschatology is, is just as silly in some ways hermeneutically as what Nicodemus is doing here. Or what Jesus, we know what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The living water, as the scriptures make clear, and all can, she can think about is H2O. Now, let me take you to a third one. This is the disciples themselves, chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. Let me find it. Um, Jesus is talking to Jesus said to them, that is his disciples, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And look what they say. The disciples therefore were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? <laughs> Who went to town and got him, bought him lunch? <laughs> I mean, it's funny. That's why you, you, we, you will make the same mistake when it comes to these eschatological issues if we're not sure that we have the right um, hermeneutical worldview in place. And Kim, this is this is important at this point. Is that I think on, on John John four John three John four, it's a bits and pieces approach to interpretation. We see those chapters in isolation. We don't see how what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus and what Jesus was saying to the uh, Samaritan woman and to the disciples. Same lesson, all three times. Yeah, that, that this lesson hasn't, this lesson isn't isolated here. This lesson has to be taken throughout all of the New Testament. Why, why, why would we ignore what Jesus says here in dealing with other aspects of the, the, the covenant promises? No, I, to, and unless somebody thinks that I'm pulling a fast one here, the way I'm taking that, you must worship God in the reality of the Spirit. Let me take you to John chapter 6. And here Jesus is actually using, I mean, he has to use a language. And here we're reading in English. He has to use a language. And the words are literal. The words are real. But what is Jesus saying? Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in yourselves. I mean, that's what he was saying. But. In fact, the 
broader group of disciples who were listening to him, that scandalized them so badly, they started to turn away. Who can take this? Who can under, begin to tolerate this? So Jesus turns to his disciples, particularly Peter, I suppose, and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, well, <laughs> you don't understand either, but where would we go? We know that you have the words of eternal life. So we are stuck with Jesus' hermeneutic. And by well, the I way, I want to tell you what that hermeneutic is in verse 63. That's the punchline. Look at verse 63. Jesus understood they didn't understand. He understood why they understand. He understood why Nicodemus didn't get it. The Samaritan woman didn't get it. His own disciples didn't get it about when he talked about food. So here is his, here's his hermeneutical lesson. And it's the same one he tried to tell the woman. The God is spirit. So he says, it is spirit who gives, the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. By flesh, he means tangible, visible, material. Literalism is not going to get it. If you think I'm actually telling you guys to commit cannibalism, of course I'm not. You have to have that spiritual reality. And let me put one more thing on the table. Now we're going to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and Paul's going to tell you the same hermeneutic. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'll put it in context by backing up to verse 9. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared to those who love him. And a lot of people stop there and think, you know, that's where we are. And I always tell people, we'll read the next verse. For to us, God has revealed them. There, here it is. Here's the theme again, through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. For who among man knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now, here comes the kicker. For we have received not the spirit, low case S, of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things are freely given to us by God. Now, here's his hermeneutic, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, as we are, in other words, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now, let me, let me read what the Greek actually says there, because it's spiritual with spiritual. And so commentators have to, or translators have to fudge to figure out um, what nouns to use with that. So if I can find my place, First Corinthians chapter 2. Yeah, the New American Standard puts, puts thoughts and words in right. italic because they're not in the, Greek, the original Greek text. Ta exactly. In other words, just because Jesus used uh, literal words like eat my body and drink my blood did not mean he he was we know that in that case in that scenario he didn't mean it literally it's a it's spiritual thoughts using um, um, the uh, literal literal words here's what verse 13 says in the Greek which things also we speak not in words taught of human wisdom but in words taught of the spirit combining spiritual things with spiritual things. So if, if that's the bottom line of this whole hermeneutical lesson. What is the new covenant hermeneutic? It's not going to be fleshly. It's not going to be earthly. Those were natural types of shadows and symbols of what was coming with Christ in the new covenant order, which would indeed be spiritual. That doesn't mean spiritual in some eth ethereal Gnostic sense. It means what form is this kingdom of God going to manifest itself in? See what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's important because when people hear the word, you know, spiritual. Yeah, they, they pit it against something as if it's otherworldly. That's not what he means. It means, what I mean by spiritual, which is why I said it's not in spirit and truth. It's not a little s, it's capital S, in spirit and truth, the reality of the spirit, which means that the, the nature in, of the new covenant kingdom New Covenant Zion, New Covenant Jerusalem is in, by, and through the Holy Spirit. With that on the table, let me take you to Romans 14, 17, which is exactly what Paul says. It's basically the only place in all of Paul where Paul finally gets down to find, the, to find what the kingdom of God is. But in verse 17 of chapter 14, he says, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So leave out that middle section and just cut connect the two parts the kingdom of god is in the holy spirit and that's what jesus was trying to tell nicodemus you're not going to understand this kingdom of god that's coming unless you are born from above and born of or in and through the spirit and brought into this kingdom then you'll see then you will know then you will understand and maybe we can save that discussion for later but that leads us right into matthew 
13 when Jesus says, blessed are your eyes that can see and blessed are your ears that they can hear because there's a lot of other people who, who have done this and they haven't seen, they haven't heard, they haven't understood because they don't have that spiritual mind. It, see, it's as simple. It sounds complex, but when you really get down to the bottom line, what's the moral lesson here? It's just as simple as can be. God is spirit, and therefore you must worship and understand all these things in the reality of the spirit. See? And I guess this, this is what makes it difficult to, okay, so we understand that that's the oper operating hermeneutic. And by the way, we've been throwing the word hermeneutic around. Science of interpretation. Yeah, yeah science, and, and James Jordan always talks about the science and the art of interpretation. It's, yeah, yeah, it takes talent, it takes wisdom. Yeah, and so, all right, so now, now we start with that understanding. Now, the, the question is always going to be, okay, I, 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 I'm grasping this, I understand this, I see how, uh, you know, Jesus in dealing with, with, with Nicodemus, dealing with a Samaritan woman, dealing with the disciples, Paul's use of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God and so forth. Okay, now, how do, you, how do then do you apply that as a hermeneutical model in terms of interpretation of other things in the Bible? Well, you have to be more specific about what, about what you mean by other things for me to grab hold of that. Well, when you come, you come, across, you come across a passage uh, let's see, can, can I think, can I think of anything off the top of my head? Well, this, just to but, understand that I'm still doing all this work solely within the sphere of trying to address this huge eschatological debate, because it is the one final, uh, area in all of biblical and all of the Christian theology that, that the church has yet come to a consensus to. You and I both know there was a man, a Scottish theologian named, named James Orr, who, uh, wrote a book called The Progress of Dogma at the turn of the 20th century, from the 19th to the 20th century. And he's basically going through and showing how the church crafted out all these doctrines as a result of being exposed to heresy upon heresy upon heresy. So they didn't start off with eschatology, they started off with the most basic things about who is God, what's the Trinity, or what's the nature of, the, of Christ, the person, and, and how do we understand the nature of the uh, humanity and divinity of Christ? And there was, there was a logic, a progression to this. And so he tracked all the way through there. And by the time you get to the Reformation, they're talking about they're not talking about those things. That's already been dealt with. Now the issues on the table are the church, sacraments, justification, that kind of stuff. And the reformers weren't ready for eschatology either, though they, they had to take a stab at it and they wrote what they thought it was, but they still didn't get it right. And so he ends the book by saying, you know what? The church has never ever, and I mean capital C, church, the whole church, has never yet had, quote unquote, its ecumenical council when it comes to the doctrine of eschatology. It just hasn't. And I really, really believe that things are cooking up now, that this we're entering into the period when, when the church will finally, finally start getting its head around this thing. And yes, it's going to be completely complex. And there's going to be all kinds of factions and views and camps and stuff arguing this stuff back and forth. But if you work it through, You'll come to the answer. The church will come to the answer, but not until it's got the right hermeneutic on the board. Otherwise, you're going to be compared apples and oranges and ships passing in the dark, and you'll get nowhere. That's the goal of what I want to accomplish in this class. That's the sole goal. So that's what we're telling up front. This is where we're headed. This is the destination where you're going to arrive at. And you may be confused. And I say, okay, of course you may be confused, just as Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and the disciples were confused. But trust us, we'll take you back, back to the beginning and we'll take you through this road map that got you to that destination. And in the end, you'll say, oh, now I understand. I understand now what you meant in that first podcast when you were talking about uh, the lesson in John 4. So we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you. Then we're going to take you back through the process, tell you, and in the end, we're going to tell you what we told you. Could you imagine what an ecumenical council on eschatology yeah. would be like? And you can imagine if they sorted out <laughs> what that would do to the church and the world. Oh, I know. Golly, unbelievable. I know. It, would make the, it would make the Reformation look like a tea party in comparison because of the implications of this stuff. But as long as the church is divided over eschatology, she's, she's shooting herself. She's so tied up in confusion. Now, why is eschatology so important? Because in a sense, it's your philosophy of history. You don't know where you're going or which way you should go or how you should go if you don't know your eschatology. But if the church can't agree on that, then the church is going in all kinds of directions. And we have to remember, we have to keep reminding I'm, I'm, I'm the listeners this, I'm going to remind you, 
Eschatology isn't just about the last of the last things. Eschatology makes up the warp and it's woof. It's the worldview. It's of, the worldview. Of the warp and woof of the whole Bible, like every other doctrine. We're not. We're, you don't go through the whole Bible and finally get to the Book of Revelation and start say, "Oh, now we're in terms of eschatology." Exactly. It, exactly. It, it runs all the way through Scripture. So if you're going to develop a doctrine of creation, you start at the beginning. You want to you, even when you start with a doctrine of Christology, you've got to start at the beginning. The the, the the, the doctrine of anthropology, study of, of man, it's all at the beginning, and it runs all the way through Scripture. And so this eschatology, as we're using the phrase, is not something that's just tacked on at the end. Exactly. It, it's, it's all it's the, the way milieu, through. It's the worldview in which all this other stuff takes place. In other words, if you really understand, people understand what I'm saying, in the light of, of that covenant uh, redemptive history of Israel, the church herself, the New Covenant Church, is an eschatological body in comparison to Old Covenant Israel. And people don't think about that. They think, oh, there's the church, and then the church is waiting for some eschatology to kick in. No, she is an eschatological reality, if you put it into context, redemptive historical context, compared to Old Covenant Israel, which was the type, shadow, and symbol of which the church is the, the ultimate reality of what everything was headed for. See what I'm saying? Okay. Eschatology is, you know, without eschatology, you can't have a hermeneutic. And without, you can't have a hermeneutic without the eschatology. So let's go right, just briefly, right back to the be beginning of this. Let's re reinforce, reinforce the point that Jesus was trying to get across to Nicodemus, to the Samaritan woman, and the disciples. Yes. Bo bottom line, what is the what is the thing that he was trying to get them to focus on? And also moving on into John chapter six as well. It's that text. I, it's just, I would go back to Paul. It's that text that Paul gave in, in, in Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy, without the Holy Spirit, I mean, Paul says in Romans nine, eight or nine, he says, if you have not the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to him. So, you know, and the, the spirit is the context. The spirit is the eschatological reality that all this is headed for. That's why you got into the question, and though we can't do it here because this is not a class in theology, it's a class in hermeneutics. But what's the connection between Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity? Why did John, Jesus say in John uh, 14, 16, 17, in that era, 14 to 16, why did he say, I must leave? So the, uh, the, the paraclete, the comforter can come, and he can't come unless I leave. I mean, you've got to understand what's going on there. Things are transitioning. The spirit is the reality, which is what they're all, they're all were missing. They could hear Jesus talk about food. They could hear Jesus talk about water. They could hear Jesus talk about new birth. But they didn't have their the right hermeneutic in their minds, that is, the reality of the spirit in order to translate and, tra and understand what was being said. But once you flip into that category and understand Jesus is talking about living water, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is talking about new birth, that is being born again, regenerated. And when Jesus was talking about, I have food which you don't know, he's talking about, again, the food, uh, the bread of life that I am. I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven. That's what he's talking about. And I'm telling you, the people don't understand it, that when it comes to all the issues in eschatology, it's the same, same question and issue at stake. And so much of the debate, it's just, it's just crazy. It's like arguing, and uh, at like Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and the disciples were arguing. They're on the wrong page. They're in the wrong ballpark. But see, I, it, I'm sure this leaves people with a deer in a headlight look, because they, they said, how can you say these things? But if you work through this stuff step by step, you will understand what, how we got there. So what I, if that means be patient, it's coming. And it makes people uncomfortable. Well, yeah. Being exposed to anything that's complex and is threatening. Because you, you, don't, you haven't mastered it. It's mastering you. But what I'm going to say, and that's what Jesus said when he turned to Peter, when people have just been scandalized because Jesus is saying, eat his body and drink my blood. Are you going away too? Are you scandalized? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, Peter would have to say, oh, no, I don't understand any more than they did. But where would we go? 
we're not leaving. We know at least this, that you are the Holy One, the Son of God. So we'll stay here and we'll be patient and you'll put up with us in our ignorance and you will, you know, bring us to that level where we finally understand. And bingo, when did Peter finally, Peter's always putting his foot in his mouth, but when did Peter finally get it right and preach the first major sermon in the New Covenant Church after Pentecost? That's the difference. The Spirit made all the difference. Now he understood. But even Peter waffled when he was up against um, Paul and, and he wanted to be kind of tempted to pull back into that old covenant order by the Judaizers. And Paul had to nail him to the wall and say, no, 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 we're not going back. We're not going to betray the gospel. Yeah, we see this in terms of Acts chapter 1. Which once again, they ask you know, this question, verse 6. Uh, and so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Yes. Is that, and that's an interesting question, because were they right or wrong in asking that question? I think they were right. But did they understand what they meant by restoring the kingdom of Israel? Yeah. No, they weren't. Yeah, he said he said to them, it is for it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy right. Spirit has come upon you. Right. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. When that Spirit came and transformed them, finally put them in the right ballpark, the right hermeneutic, now they get it. Now they understand. Because one aspect of this chess people, uh, chess pieces on the board is this book of eschatology is about the restoration of Israel. But does that mean, oh, I should be a dispensationalist then? I should be a Zionist? Well, if you don't have the right harmony, you could easily be led that, that way because you can take text and, and make them interpret that way very simply. But is that what the New Testament means by the restoration of Zion? And you'll find out, no, it doesn't. But there is a Zion. There is a Zion. There is a Jerusalem. But what kind is it? What's its nature? What's its form? That's the key question. And how do I know what its nature or form is? Well, you got to know which covenant order we're talking about, old or new. And that means behind that, you got to know, well, what's the hermeneutic? The old covenant hermeneutic or the new covenant hermeneutic that operates here? So this brings me to this question. Someone says, well, wait a minute. I have the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, this, this preacher he has the Holy Spirit. That preacher has the Holy Spirit. So why aren't these guys getting it if they have the Holy Spirit? And why aren't I getting it if I have the Holy Spirit? Off the surface, I would say, because the, that understanding process is the is a, uh, a tandem operate, a work of the Spirit and the Word, the Word and the Spirit. The Spirit's not going to work without the Word, and the Word's not going to work without the Spirit. The two have to be there. So, yeah, you may have the Holy Spirit, but you haven't studied the Word. You haven't mastered the Word. You haven't really gotten into its warp and woof and its heart and soul. But it's like I said before, these, to the guys in the field. You don't do this immediately. No one does this. I'm 40 years down the road in doing this stuff. So, yes, it's, it's just the – it's it's no sweat, no, uh, no pain, no gain. No sweat, you're not going to get anywhere. You, it's just read, 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 dig, dig, dig into the Scriptures. And – First rule is this, get out of the way and let Scripture interpret itself. Don't come to Scripture and say, I know what this means, so I'm not going to even think about it. I know what this means, or I know what that means, or this is, can't mean that, or, or it must mean this. You never, ever do that. I don't. You keep saying, well, I don't understand what Jesus meant when he said there are some of those who are standing here who should not taste of death until the Son of Man comes. But I had to make a decision. Either I believe Jesus or I don't. It's as simple as that. I don't know what he means. I don't know how he can mean it. But I believe him. And so I'm going to keep the door open. I'm going to keep my mind open. I'm going to read scripture and read scripture and read scripture until I finally see what he meant. And he was right. I mean, there's just no shortcuts. The word and the spirit, the spirit and the word. And that's a hard thing for people to do. They see a passage like Matthew 16, 27 through 28, uh, and they say, wait a minute, that, that sounds like Jesus is talking about something that's on the horizon of that particular crowd, but that just doesn't make sense. And the next and the next thing they should say, but they don't say because they don't know how to say it, is it doesn't fit my hermeneutic. Right, Which and that says more about you and your hermeneutic than it does about Scripture. Scripture is infallible. Scripture knows exactly what it's saying and why it's saying it and how it's saying it. 
So if you find yourself in conflict with scripture, there's no, it's not, it's a no brainer. You're on the wrong page. You have not understood yet. Never ever charge scripture with error. So yeah, it's a humiliating thing, not humility. It's, it's a humbling thing to be, come to scripture because it's going to say, I'm not going to make compromises with you here. I have, the scripture has its own worldview, its own hermeneutic, its own you know, moral, its own understanding of things. And so, and even its own definition of terms, you can't use Webster's dictionary to inter- and understand the New Testament. Scripture will tell you what its own words mean. And that's what Paul is saying, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, not words out of Webster's dictionary. It's the, it, it is the words you find in Webster's dictionary, but with the meaning that the Spirit has given to them in the context of historical and covenantal context in which Scripture is dealing with this issue. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it can be done. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you have questions or comments on what you hear on this podcast, please send them to podcast at AmericanVision.org. That's podcast at AmericanVision.org. And until next time, keep reading and studying your Bible.